Blue Lamp started life at the Gainsborough Studios. It was the idea of its boss, Sidney Box. The project was assigned to two writers, Jan Reed and Ted Willis, and the idea was to propagate a, a positive image of the police. With the demise of Gainsborough, the project went to Ealing Studios, where their star writer, T.E.B. Clark, was brought in to polish and rewrite the script. In characteristic Ealing fashion, they adopt a naturalistic style, and the film, which was released in January of 1950, directed by Basil Dearden and cinematographers Gordon Dines, who would go on to perfect the form in their next Ealing outing, Pool of London. The daily routines and lives of the officers are highlighted and they're shown to behave as a socially cohesive unit, enjoying their hobbies, gardening, darts, choir practice, while being capable of going into efficient and uh, effective action when required. They do everything with good humour and understanding, idealistic propaganda certainly, but beautifully conveyed. And the depiction of the police as being a valued part of the local community has to be accepted to make sense of the film's climax. Everything revolves around Paddington Green Police Station, and that stood here in Paddington Green. It's all gone now to make way for Westminster College, which you can see behind me. The central character is George Dixon, and George Dixon lives with his wife Emily M, played by Gladys Henson. Jack Warner, of course, is uh, George Dixon. They live in uh, Philip Place, which actually has also been demolished to make way for the college. Even the view over in this direction towards Bishopsbridge Road has now been obscured by the Westway development, the elevated section of the A40, which was constructed between 1964 and 1970. George Dixon is a living, breathing part of his local community, which he understands completely. Excuse me, officer, can you direct me to Paddington Station? Yes, sir. Straight across the green, turn left over the Iron Bridge and you're there. Thank you very much. Ealing's propensity for location shooting and their desire, the desire of this film to show police officers on the beat going about their normal duties leads to several scenes of them undertaking mundane activities, not least giving directions to the public. You actually see George Dixon doing that outside this uh, children's hospital, at least it was in those days. It closed down as a hospital in 1987 and has now been converted into flats. It's a grade two listed building. We see the distinctive chimneys and roof in the background of a key scene where it's actually taken in Westland, Wasteland over there when Andy Mitchell discovers a small girl, Queenie, playing with a revolver. Look out! Cut this! You hiding something? No. This beautiful spot is London's Little Venice. In the film, it's part of the beat for the Paddington Green officers. In fact, this is where we first meet Andy Mitchell. He's uh, escorting a small lost boy over this bridge, which is Westbourne Terrace Road Bridge, before meeting George Dixon, just ahead of me. You see a gate post, a brick gate post in that shot, and he's given a lesson in the importance of knowing your local community. Kid's lost, doesn't even know his own name. No? Now look, Monty Green, you try this on again and you'll get into trouble. Go on, get off home. He knows he gets a jam bun every time he's taken to the station. <laughs> it's a hotty little devil. Never mind, Andy. There's one thing they couldn't teach you at Peel House. Yeah, I suppose not. George Dixon later gives Andy further advice, this time on how to get through the long and lonely night beat. He does that here in front of Canal Cottage on Delamere Terrace before the police sergeant comes up and asks them if everything's OK. All correct, sergeant. Well, all correct, sergeant. What do you mean, all correct? Standing here gossiping like a couple of old women? You're supposed to be on your own now, Mitchell. How much longer do you want to be wet nursed? Go on, break it up. Good, Sergeant. Next time you'll both be riding a 728. T.E.B. Clark's uh, consensual eating world, where even the criminals have a code of conduct, is threatened by a new breed of teenage delinquent, personified by Dirk Bogart's Tom Riley. We first meet Tom Riley uh, with his associate, Spud, played by Patrick Doonan, when they're trying to negotiate a deal with a, an old style veteran crime lord at a billiard hall near Lillywhite's Piccadilly Circus. They fell. They're going to carry out their plan anyway, which is to steal keys to a shop in Edgware Road and then carry out a robbery. But I'm by the Edgware Road tube station and the Westway continues its destruction of our locations because the jewellery shop was at number 290, which is right onto the flyover in front of me. It all looks very different now. In those days, there wasn't even a road crossing here. Harrow Road stopped just over there. And on the junction of Harrow Road and Edgware Road stood that extraordinary building we see in the film decorated with a huge gold flake logo. We see it in the background of the scenes of the jewellery robbery and in its aftermath. 
Behind me, you can see the new Paddington Green Police Station. That actually stands on the site of the Metropolitan Music Hall, which sadly was demolished in 1963. The Metropolitan, of course, plays a, a big role in the film. That's where Spud and Tom Riley concoct an alibi by pretending to watch the great Tessie O'Shea on stage. This is where the crime takes place that will lead to the death of George Dixon. I'm at 324 Harrow Road, and that was where the Coliseum Cinema stood. Sadly, the Coliseum closed in 1956 and was subsequently demolished. But the building next to it survives. You recognise those window casings from the film. I had to let him have it. He was coming straight for me. Maniac, that's what you are. This view up the Harrow Road from the site of the Coliseum towards Ambly Road and Southern Avenue is clearly recognisable from the film. Indeed, it's between those two streets that George Dixon is pounding the, the beat on the fateful night. And it's there that he confirms to his sergeant that the police station have won their darts match. We've actually seen Southern Avenue previously in the film. It's where the Welsh officer Taff Hughes, played by Meredith Edwards, is on patrol on the night of the jewellery robbery and gets coshed by Tom Riley for his troubles. In what becomes a murder investigation in full flow, there are several scenes set at New Scotland Yard and its outposts. Those are genuine. Uh, the Evening Studios got on unprecedented cooperation from the Metropolitan Police while they were making the film. It's important to the ethos of the film that routine police work is seen to be carried on despite the overriding uh, concerns of the officers to actually bring the murder of George Dixon to justice. We're back in Harrow Road, Maryland Road on the other side, and it's here that we see a police officer assisting a pensioner across the road. We also get this scene going that direction when Andy spots Tom Riley talking to his girlfriend Diana outside the Coliseum Theatre and recognises her as the girl that's been reported missing. Actually, it's rather clever because you're looking in precisely the wrong direction, such as the magic of cinema. As the police go about their daily duties, we get several views of the Edgware Road. The film's keen to emphasise the high esteem which the police are held in by even the most unlikely members of the community. And it's just here that Barrow boy Glyn Houston offers his best wishes on hearing that uh, George Dixon is reported to be recovering from his gunshot wounds before Andy Mitchell tells him to move on. Behind me on the corner, distinctive building you can see in the film, that's uh, on the corner of Boscobel Street. At the time, it was a pub called the Portman Arms. A brief but important sequence happens just here. We're back at the Harrow Road on the junction of Chippenham Road. And it's here that Andy Mitchell flags down Rennie Gadd for driving without due care and attention. The film then contrasts her haughty superiority, the rejection of everything that Ealing believes in, with Andy's stoic self-control. The building behind me, absolutely the same as it is in the film. And when the camera in the film pivots round slightly, we get a view of the pub. It's still there, the Windsor Castle. I'm just warning you this time, madam, to drive more carefully in the future. Thank you. This is the Formosa Street uh, side of the canal. We get this view with the spire of St Mary Magdalene Church in the background when Tom Riley crosses over the canal to get to Spud's lodgings on the other side. The current bridge isn't quite as spectacular as the one we see in the film, but it's in exactly the same position. Key moment in the film in the investigation of George Dixon's murder is the discovery of the murder weapon. It's just down there, in fact, that the little girl, Queenie, shows the police where she fished the weapon out of the canal, though they shoot it from the other direction. In fact, there's a, there's a sequence of montage of police officers searching the area, which is actually reused in the T.E.B. Clark comedy classic Lavender Hill Mob, uh, which was released by Ealing uh, in 1951. It's on this corner of Delamere Terrace and Lord Hills Road that Spud has his lodgings. And it's there that Tom Riley finds his girlfriend, Diana, and attempts to strangle her and is arrested by Andy Mitchell. He evades arrest because Spud returns just in time and they make their exit down this road, Senior Street, which, like the whole area, has changed much since the film was being shot. But the local landmark is this spectacular Grade 1 listed church, St Mary Magdalene, designed by George Edmund Street. It opened in 1878. It's rather bizarre, but I think engaging appearance is largely determined by the difficulties of the site on which it was built, a spoil bank resulting from the excavation of this stretch of the canal. After Tom Riley and Spud make their getaway, they're soon pursued by the police. Andy Mitchell picks up a police car outside this church. Riley and Spud drive over this bridge with the police in close pursuit. This is Ladbroke Grove Railway Bridge. You actually see that scene again, reused in the Lavender Hill mob. 
In those days, you could drive directly down Portobello Road over there, and that's what Spud and Riley do. Filmed a very high angle shot, presumably from buildings, top of buildings right on the other side of the road. The pursuit continues down Portobello Road and then rejoins Labrick Grove to get to here. This is the corner of Lansdowne Crescent. That house to behind me on the corner, absolutely recognisable from the film. They continue to drive up ahead of me and then turn right into the other end of Lansdowne Crescent. So the car chase continues down here. This is Clarendon Cross. They come here, they're going over there into Portman Road. This area wasn't pedestrianised in those days, of course. Um, behind me on the corner, you can see a, a shop and look at those jars decorating it. You can see those in the film as well. Apparently it indicates the previous occupant was a professional oil paint grinder. This bench is dedicated to local resident, the late uh, much loved actor Ralph Bates. This is on the pedestrianised part of uh, Portland Road. So the cars drive over here, then veer off to my left down Penzance Place. It's about here that the schoolgirls are walking past the public bars before inadvertently holding up the pursuing police car. The pursuit continues to here. This is Freston Street, or it's now Freston Street, and we see that bridge in the film. This is the police car messages and they call it Latimer Street. Indeed, that was the name at the time. This was quite a major thoroughfare, in fact, but it got cut in half by our nemesis, the Westway, when it was extended and subsequently suffered a name change. The car chase comes to a climax here. This is Stern Street, just behind Shepherd's Bush uh, Station. The giveaway is the house behind me with its unusual chimneys. So it's just there that the car spins out of control, spuds knocked unconscious and left to be picked up by the police. But Tom Riley manages to clamber out and make his way across scrubland and railway tracks to get to the White City Greyhound Stadium. The Greyhound Stadium stood just here, it's south of the Westway alongside Wood Lane. It was demolished in 1985 to make way for, eventually make way for a media centre known as White City Place, partly occupied by the BBC. The blue lamp's a reminder that White City was a stadium of national importance. It was built for the 1908 London Olympics and hosted a wide range of events there. It was capable of housing 93,000 spectators. It became principally known as a Greyhound Stadium in the late 1920s. It still hosted other events, including a football match during the 1966 World Cup. Tom Riley makes his way here, mingles with the crowd attempting to evade arrest. But he's broken too many codes of conduct and the police and the underworld combine to cause his downfall. The bookies are persuaded to indicate his whereabouts and in an extraordinary finale, the crowd deliver him into the arms of the police. You two take him away. I'll be along in a minute. You all right, Mitchell? Yes, thank you, Sergeant. Nice work. Thank you, sir. I'm afraid I've got this in a bit of a mess, Sergeant. Oh, that's all right. Where's your helmet you gone for? You can't go around like that, you know. We've been properly dressed.